thank you for tuning in to the latest addition to my YouTube channel, the Postgrad series. My name is Ekta, and as you can probably already guess, I'm a new podiatry graduate. In this series, we talk to all kinds of amazing people who've done amazing things since they themselves have graduated. Today, I'm speaking to a very well-known and well-respected pediatric surgeon, Claire Freeman. Claire began her podiatry journey at the University of Brighton before going on to become a fellow at the Royal College of Pediatric Surgery. Claire is also an independent prescriber and a registered tutor. And one of these days, I will learn how to talk properly. <laughs> so with lots of love, let's get into this episode. Hi, Claire. How are you doing? Hi, I'm really good. Thank you. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here this evening. And um, uh, I'm grateful that you've asked me to come and speak. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much for coming on to my, my YouTube channel. It's just, honestly, it's amazing to speak to um, someone of your caliber. I think I, I have so much respect for you. So, um, yes, thank you so much for saying yes. Um, well, it's very, very sweet for you to say, but, you know, just remember that um, we're all just people. We're all just people doing the job, uh, trying to do the best that we can do, being the best people that we are. And um, actually, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to share some of my insights and my stories and whatever. So, um, yeah, it's great to be here. Awesome. And that's actually a brilliant segue. So um, may I ask, please, what, why did you choose pediatric surgery? Um, well, I, I guess it goes back even further than, you know, why surgery it goes back to why podiatry. And for me, it was a late career choice. It was my second career. I'd already worked in banking for a number of years before I married and had a child. And it was only when my, um, my first daughter started walking and she walked very early that, um, I sort of looked at it in horror and thought her feet didn't look right. You know, there's my perfect baby and something wasn't quite right about her. And um, so my lovely health visitor said, oh, you need to go and see a podiatrist about this. So I shimmied down to a clinic in Hove, which is where I lived, and saw a podiatrist there who is still working in podiatry, I'm pleased to say. And he explained things about what was going on. It was, it was a very simple thing. Her second toe didn't touch the ground when she was walking. Oh. So, um, and he explained things in biomechanical terms. Well, prior to working in banking, I had trained as a dancer. So when he started explaining things about how the body functioned and the mechanics of the foot, I just thought, wow, I understand this. This is amazing. And this is, this is something, this is healthcare. This is about helping people. And uh, so from then, I just became really, really interested and decided that I wanted to train, um, applied to the Leaf Hospital in Brighton, and uh, only then discovered it was a science degree. I had no idea. I thought it was just <laughs> about, I thought it, well, I thought it was about movement, but I didn't realise it was science. Um, and I had A-levels in, in um, economics and art. That was no use to me at all. So um, I, had to go, I had to go back to night school and do a human biology A-level before I could even start my degree. So I did that, did my degree, loved it. Um, and just on that note, I, um, I found out, I just, I read a post today, actually, that one of our local podiatrists had put on, who trained at the Leaf Hospital, that, that um, Brighton University are moving out of Eastbourne completely. So the Leaf Hospital where I trained, which I feel is my sort of spiritual home, is no longer going to be the place where podiatrists train in the south, in the south which is just heartbreaking. But hey. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm really sad, actually. That is really um, sad. Yeah, because not only did I train there, but I went back and I did my master's degree there. And I also worked as a clinical tutor one day a week and mm -hmm. I lectured to the second years um, on the undergraduate programme and I've lectured to the master's students there as well. And it's just like, you know, that's that's where I it's my my yo-yo. You know, I go back there to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be there any longer. So, oh my goodness. Um, so I'm really sad about that. So having having done my undergraduate degree, I started work, working. Well, I was always interested in the mechanics. It was for me because that, that's what got me into podiatry in the first place is biomechanics. Mm. Um, and when I started my first job, um, I started hearing these sort of noisy rumours about these, these surgeons who did stuff. And, and to be honest, as an undergraduate, I hadn't really taken on board pediatric surgery at all. Um, I think that we'd had 
one visit from a surgeon for about half an hour or something and it hadn't really kind of registered with me so it's only when I started working that um, I started to hear more about surgeons and one of the podiatrists who was working in the uh, unit where I worked in Kent, he was training and he said, oh, you should come up and see, you should come up and um, spend some time in the theatre and, and see what it's all about. So I, I kind of invited my way in to go and observe a theatre session. And, um, and that was it. I was hooked. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was so exciting. Um, and it was just, it kind of, it ticked so many boxes for me because it was about extending the learning that you'd already done. And bearing in mind, I'd been on a sort of long learning curve already, having done the A-level and then I'd done the the, um, the bachelor's. And I just thought this is an opportunity to do something which is really exciting, can really make a difference to the structural position, uh, the, the structure of the foot, as well as the function of it. Much more, it's, it's a sort of, you know, an elevated level from biomechanics from my point of view. Um, but it's also the opportunity to study more um, and work with a group of people who were the sort of at the top end of their profession. Um, and although I didn't, you know, I, I, I never had that sort of ambitious to feel like I was at the top end. I kind of had the ambition to work within the group of people who were changing things and moving forward and making differences. Um, so that that was why I chose podiatric surgery because it was it was that it was a, a series of events which kind of like led to an event of me going up and seeing theatre and just thinking this is where I want to be. This is and 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 I have never regretted it. You know, having you know, I still say my happy place is in one of the theatres that I love, which is either the operating theatre. <laughs> Or the performing theatre, you know, one or the other. They're my happy places. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, um, if I may ask, what were some of the? I mean, I I know you're absolutely in love with pediatric surgery, and it, it definitely comes across when you when you talk about it, and you you know your face your face lights up, which I think is such a wholesome thing. Mm. Um, but what were some of the challenges you faced early on in your journey to becoming a surgeon? So I think some of the challenges were related to me as a person and some of them were related to anybody who wants to go on and study something when they're in a position of having to work and support family. Um, and some of them were unique to paediatric surgery. So, you know, there were plenty of challenges. Um, and I, I, did actually, I, did a, um, I did a presentation at a conference one year, and I can't remember what year it was, it was quite a few years ago, um, and they asked me to talk about the barriers to women becoming surgeons. And I just thought, you know what, we don't want to talk about barriers. Perhaps, <laughs> we, just, perhaps we just want to think about gates, you know, the gates that you can open or you can climb. You know, a barrier yeah. means don't go there, doesn't it? So I, I It does, of, yeah. I, I don't really like the term barriers at all. So, I, I, yes, there were, there were plenty of gates that I had to climb, and plenty of gates that I had to kick down um, in order to get where I wanted to get. And so, so I, I think, you know, for me, the, um, the the biggest gate or hurdle I had to get over was, was the issue of time and time management. Um, and that's mm -hmm. probably true for anybody who is doing sort of a higher degree. If you're, if you're trying to earn a living, and I was bringing up a family as well, um, and to find time to study on top of doing that is quite, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And I mm -hmm. think the only way to do it is to be disciplined. Um, and, you know, I had to do things like give myself protected time in the evening between nine o'clock and 11 o'clock at night. That was the only time that I could have quiet time to study. And it's not, it's not my ideal time to actually study effectively I'm much better at it. my brain works better in the morning but it was the only way I could do it um with all the other things I had to fit in so really you know time was one of the um the big hurdles for me mm. um I think you know tied in with that as I've already alluded to there was the fact that I was bringing up a family so I didn't actually start my pediatric surgery training um for about seven years so once i once i decided i really loved surgery 
um, I was lucky enough to be taken on as a specialist podiatrist in the surgery unit. So I worked for about seven years as a specialist podiatrist. And that was fantastic because it meant that I had all the experience of working in a unit. I saw other people train. I saw them going from, you know, starting to the point where they were graduating, getting their fellowship and moving on. Um, it meant that I could really hone my skills because basically my job there was to do all the anaesthetic blocks and prepare mm. patients for theatre and do out patients, so, you know, taking stitches out and things like that. So with things which don't fall in the, the category for general podiatry, they were extended skills, but I got to do that and do it over and over and again. So I, I kind of honed my skills with that. Um, and um, I kind of made the decision that I waited until my youngest child was two before I started my surgical training. And I did that intentionally because I wanted to be able to really commit to it. I just didn't feel that I was going to be able to do that before I'd got the kids to a certain stage where you know, two of them were off at school and one was you know, at the age where she could go to place, um, daycare and things like that before I started my um, study. So, you know, fitting that all in with the family, um, you know, I, that, that takes some dedication. And I know that as I progressed through, when I, when I got my training post, so I did my pupillage up in Doncaster, um, you know, this, th that, that was a real hurdle for me because Doncaster's four hours drive from where I live. So to work there two days a week, um, I had to, I, well, I stayed up, I, I worked two consecutive days and I used to stay away from home for two days. Um, and I, when I, when I was given the job and I, I, to be honest, when I went for the interview, I really didn't think I was in with any chance of getting the job. I, I, I hadn't mm -hmm. actually really considered that they'd offer me the job because there was a lot of competition for it. Um, and then when I was offered the job, I was really quite shocked. And, and I decided that the best thing to do was to go home. And at that point, I hadn't even told my husband that I'd been for this interview. I just said I was going to go <laughs> off and I told him I was going to go and visit, visit surgeons in Doncaster. So I came home and, and I, so I thought, oh, I've been offered the job. Um, so what I did was I spoke, I spoke to each of my three children individually and separately and said to them, look, I've been offered a job. You know, it's it's a long way from home. I'll be away from home two days a week. This is what it means to me, and this is what this is what it means to you, and this is how it will work. And um, you know, bless them, all three of my children said, "Do it." You know, why not? Do oh. it. And I just <laughs> because I had it wasn't that they gave me permission. It's just that they were signed up to it, and my husband was signed up to yeah. it as well. And I think if I hadn't had that. I'd never succeeded. So, you know, it was, it's about man managing the people in my life as well as managing my life and my career as well. Mm. So it's all these kind of balls that you have to juggle with. Um, so, and I think that's probably something that a lot of women have to think about if they want to go on and do training. Um, I know mm. um, there's another pediatric surgeon who's um, doing her registrar post at the moment and she stays away from her um home her home and her children um at least two nights a week i think um but she mm -hmm. uh, like me she waited till she was at the stage where she felt comfortable to do that and it would work for their family so i i think that the, the path for women is sometimes different than the path for men you have to make different decisions it doesn't mean you can't do it you know yeah, I, I did it. Anybody can do it. It's, it's my view. You just have to want to do it enough. I, I absolutely get that. And it just kind of seems like for and I, I don't mean to make this about a, a gender thing at all. But it does seem that if you're a woman, it, it seems to be a very long end game. And it, you have to be very, very patient and mm. really just stick through and, and make sure you're wanting to be committed to it. Um, because being a specialist podiatrist, seven years, and then you've got six years of doing the MSc and then doing the training. So that's, that's a big chunk of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, that's absolutely true. And I, I think it, you know, maybe it depends on your personality type, how, um, mm. how important it is to you to make the goals. Um, mm. But for me, um, and I'm not saying this is right for everybody, for me, it, the journey was important. 
um, you know, arriving yeah. at the destination was fantastic. But if the if the journey if I didn't enjoy the journey, there's no point being on on the train. So um, that so I know that my training program was probably much slower than other people's training programs because I managed it alongside everything else I had to do as well. Um, not least the fact that some of the training changed along my pathway. So I started mm. doing, um, um, historically, we used to do a different gateway into it. So we used to do some exams. We used to call them part A and part B, and you had to pass part A before you could apply for your pupillage. And part A was a, a written exam with five exam uh, essay questions that you had to answer. Uh, and you couldn't mm -hmm. apply for your pupillage until you did that. So I started on that programme. And then they uh, introduced the master's programme uh, so that people could do their master's modules and then apply for um, their pupillage. So I decided that if I then continued with the programme that I was on, um, I would be becoming a fellow at the same time as other people who had a master's degree and I didn't. So I decided to do right. master's, I decided to do a master's degree as well because <laughs> it made sense to me to yeah so so I just did it. I, I see I where you're coming more, from. That does yeah. I did a few more modules and I did a research project and I got a master's out of it as well, um, yeah. which meant that um, you know there's the sort of the academic kudos that goes with that as well as getting my fellowship. So. So, so there were certain things which changed while I was doing my training, and I felt that I I had to take on extra work as well in order to get those qualifications. And um, yeah, so that, that was another little gate that I had to kick down. <laughs> <laughs> now, this this question's a bit personal, but I I really need to ask. Um, and you don't have to answer at all, by the way. Um, but did you ever what mental um challenges did you have to or what mental hurdles did you have to overcome because when you're I mean I think a lot of people that I speak to um often say like oh you know I'm such and such age and there's no point starting another career now or um a really good one is a friend of mine who's just I mean he's just like 31 or something like that and um he's been doing his job for about a decade and he, he loves it great job but he was um thinking of changing careers and i was like you know why don't you try um going back to university and, and retraining as something else and he's just like no i'm i'm 31 now and i'm a bit old for that and i've got mortgage to pay and just all these responsibilities so i was mm. wondering did you ever go through any kind of uh, challenges like that well financial challenges absolutely and and um you know, that can always be difficult when you decide to make a career change, particularly if you're going back to university uh, and you're not able to mm -hmm. have uh, the same salary that you may have been earning before, even if you're working part time. Um, so financial challenges, absolutely, for sure. Um, I have never added up how much it cost me to train as a paediatric surgeon because mm. um, I think it would probably scare me silly i mean <laughs> there was certain things there were so many expensive things to do i mean i was just thinking i was thinking earlier about all the things i had to do so you know when i was doing um the original training program where we had to sit part a it was something like 500 pounds each time you sat that exam i failed it twice <sighs> third time i passed it. Uh. So that's fifteen hundred pounds just to get that exam. That's a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> oh my then, goodness. And then I had to do all the master's modules as well, and they're about sort of four or five hundred pounds each. Um, some of the books. That yeah, I no bought, pressure. <laughs> yeah, some of the books that I bought. I mean, I, I've got old-fashioned text printed copies of books. I know a lot of people like e-books, but um, mm -hmm. I really like to have a book. Book. Um, and some of these, mm. some of these copies were, you know, four hundred pounds for the book. Um, in yeah. really, really expensive books. So um, I've never sat down and added up how much it cost me to train, including you know, driving up to Doncaster once a week for four years and, you know, things like that. I haven't added mm -hmm. it up, but um, yeah, it, it, it did. It, it, it cost a lot. And, and I guess I was, you know, 
I was fortunate in that I had a part-time job and I was doing some private practice and our, our family circumstances were that between us, you know, we, we managed, but I can see that yeah. being, being something which, which would stop people from making a decision to go on and do, um, you know, further training. But I just, you know, the idea of somebody of 31 who thinks that they're too old to go on and do something else. Well, I know, you know what, absolutely you know, blows my mind. <laughs> we've grown up for such a long time, aren't we? And, and I think yeah. that, 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 that people have become much more fluid now about all sorts of things. I mean, mm. you know, I, in my childhood, we, we were expected to choose a career which we stay with forever and and to be honest I, I came I had, there, there was very limited expectations I mean school said to me do you want to be a secretary or do you want to be a nurse you know that, that was the expectations from from my childhood let me get my barf bag right now <laughs> um, whereas I think now there's so, there's so much opportunity and, and I think the idea that somebody becomes a dot 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 and stays doing that for the rest of their life I, th I think that's that's mm. that's a sort of you know 20th century philosophy rather than the 21st century um so i i know I, I guess it's difficult if it, you're i like your friend you said if he likes what he's doing but he obviously he feels unchallenged because he wouldn't be thinking about doing other things otherwise um uh, i just think yeah. you know go for it that's my attitude to <laughs> try it try it <laughs> no, no, maybe he just didn't want to do podiatry i think <laughs> I think it was a polite way of saying, no, thank you. Feet are not for me. <laughs> mm, yeah, well, yeah, maybe. Maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, we've discussed the, the challenges you faced early on in your career, but what are some of the challenges you face, face now, if any? Um, I mean, yes, yeah, there are challenges. Um, and I think, um, you know, one of them is that to stay at the top of your career and your your profession you have to continually continually learn um uh, i feel i feel very blessed because um i've got an inquisitive mind and i want to learn you know i i, I listened to two podcasts mm -hmm. earlier today because um i like mondays i work at home and i go for a walk at lunchtime and i listen to some of the the podcast like um um podcasts today and and they were they were really good and some a lot of it was revision, you know, stuff that um, mm -hmm. I've learned and done and I use. But actually hearing somebody else talk about it is always useful. So, um, you know, mm. the, the, the continually updating, reminding, revising, I think that that's a challenge of finding time to do that. Um, I think that for me, where I am at the moment with with the work that I do, I'm very very fortunate that I've got a fantastic job, really fantastic. I work with an amazing team in a forward thinking company. It's a private company that does NHS contract work, and we have just had a CQC inspection and we've had an outstanding report. And I feel very blessed to be working with a team of people who are outstanding. The other side of that is it's quite challenging to be able to make any changes or develop or do anything novel within a company where they're very, very risk averse. And I'm not saying that I want to go out and do experimental stuff at all. But, you know, just, you know, even changing a technique slightly, the amount of mm. processes and meetings and discussions we have to do just, you know, for instance, we, we want to change from using a certain plate, um, which is produced right. by one company to using a different plate from another company. And, you know, it's taken us about a year of negotiation to be able to make that change and, and, and i think we're there i think we've got what, there. for one plate mm. yeah yeah i mean the, yeah yeah <laughs> things things, things can move that. slowly and, and well so I, I need to explain what i mean by a plate this is this is, <laughs> this is an implant that we put into the foot um, and, uh, you know, this is not something you eat off, okay? <laughs> so, you know, it's a plate, and, and it's important because you know, we don't 
<laughs> you're only taking risks or doing or causing harm to patients or whatever. But to be able to get to the point where we can justify changing what we do takes quite a lot of um, right. effort. So um, yeah. you know, th th this is something which which I, I get frustrated with. Um, but I, I have to rein myself back and say that, you know, it's just something we'll get there if 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 it's right to do it. And, and there are all these processes in place to make sure that it's good and, and safe thing to do. Um, and that's why, um, you know, the company that I work for is so fantastic because they, they do have all these processes in place. But, you know, I, I find personally, I find that quite challenging sometimes. Um, and then there are there are all the other processes that are challenging, such as um, the fact that to do to, to do some surgeries on patients, the NHS will fund it without any questions. And to do other mm -hmm. surgeries, such as a hallux vulgus correction, we have to apply for funding for each and every single patient that we do that for. Um, and the funding process um, is fairly straightforward we have to put in an application which meets certain criteria um it, it, I, it's incredibly frustrating that that sometimes the funding board will, will say no um even though the criteria in my mind have been met um so the these decisions have been made by administrators who are deciding where the money is spent and not clinicians and I, 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 I'm very challenged by the fact that um, I have to then go back and justify clinically why this patient needs a procedure because I, I feel that kind of uh, it, it's um, I, it, it puts down my integrity as a clinician to help the patient decide what's right for them because it's decided on from a financial point of view uh, and I find that challenging. Um, so, so, yeah. so, you know, there, there are things which are part of a job, which, which you have to behave professionally. <laughs> so I'm just thinking if there are any other <laughs> challenges. Oh, for me, I, I, I wrote down a few notes earlier. One of the things that I do find incredibly challenging in my job as well is the, um, IT not keeping up with what we want it to be doing. So, you know, Wi-Fi dropping out and and oh. I have so many layers of security to get into different systems. Uh, one of the hospitals where I um, request x-rays and view x-rays, there are three layers mm. of security for me to get into it. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, and it can take me half an hour on the line to the IT support to get that sorted out. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, sort of, sort of the operational things can be quite frustrating. Mm. That, that does sound very, very frustrating. I would not, mm. I do not have the temper for that. <laughs> it's not for me. Um, if there's one thing you could pick about changing um, pediatric surgery, what would you change? Oh gosh, I couldn't pick one because there are lots of things that I would like to change. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't pick one. I mean, you know, the, the big one, the big one is that I would really like there to be more opportunity for jobs and career pathways so that people who are starting mm -hmm. their training have some security of knowing that they're going to progress uh, and they're going to pr mm -hmm. progress in a way where they're mentored and, um, and supported as well. So, you know, funding for training posts, um, career pathways, more jobs opening up. And it, it's just such a shame because, you know, there is so, so much work out there that we could be doing. Um, but we yeah. haven't, we haven't broken through enough to be able to be um, mainstream as yet. Uh, you know, there are some, some areas in the UK where pediatric surgery is doing exceptionally well, exceptionally well. Um, but it's not it's not consistent through the country, which is a shame. So so there are lots of things I'd I'd like to see tra change about the training system. Yeah, I mean that that'd be a great start. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for anybody that's looking to get into pedi a pediatric surgery? Um. So, um, I think the main bit of advice is to go and find a pediatric surgeon and go and spend some time with them 
be, I think that is absolutely invaluable. Um, I know that mm -hmm. what it did for me was it cemented my belief that this is what I wanted to do and, and where I should be. And that kept me going through the, the, the tricky times. And there, there are tricky times, there are challenging mm -hmm. times and you have to have resilience. And I don't think you can have that unless you're really committed and you're really sure that it's right for you. So um, there are lots of pediatric surgeons who welcome students to come and spend some time. Um, I've got, uh, this Wednesday, I've got a, um, a band six specialist podiatrists from our local NHS trust coming in to observe in the afternoon. Um, and I think that um, what that, A, it, it breaks down any kind of barriers between, you know, podiatrists who think, oh, you're a consultant, you know, oh, I don't know what I'm going to say, or, or is it right for me to be <laughs> questioning you about things or asking questions or, you know, mm. whatever. It breaks down those barriers if you can, if you can go and visit somebody. But it also introduces yeah. you to maybe not the whole breadth and depth of pediatric surgery, but, um, I think it gives you the chance to see what the opportunities are and also to really see mm -hmm. if this is something that you want to take on because uh, I, I, I think it's a huge mistake to go off and do a master's and then say, oh, no, I'll find a surgeon to see if I see if I can do some surgery. I think it's a huge mistake because uh, people will arrive then not having any kind of idea about it, what it's like to be in the theatre. And it's not all about theatre. You know, okay. theatres... It is probably a third of my time. The rest of it is outpatients. But having those skills to, you know, be able to read X-rays, talk to a patient, manage a family, um, you know, the patient's family. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't mean my family, but you know, patient, patient <laughs> might come in. With, with, you know, it, it, it might be they've got, brought their mother with them, or they, or sometimes we have parents who have got young children with them and things like that. So it's it's all of those skills, which I, I guess you have to a certain extent with podiatry, um, but I think with pediatric mm. surgery, there, there's there's a sort of, there's a little bit more of an element of risk and you have to really do a really good job of communicating and putting that across. And mm. I think that, that that you do need to sort of upskill your general podiatry training to be able to, to do that part of the job really well. Um, and then there's all the sort of, you know, research and audit and stuff, the things which are part and part of our job as well. So, you know, theatre is probably about a third of my time. But if 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 theatre doesn't make you buzz, then it's not the right career for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I thought that's very well put. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> that's no I just it's absolutely amazing and it's it's love it's lovely to get that perspective as well because you've you know you've been there you've done that um so it's the you're the best person to talk to about about advice for anybody that's looking to become a, a pediatric surgeon so again thank you so much for your time and your advice and your wisdom today it's massively appreciated <laughs> oh, bless you well you know um, as I say I I for me it it has been a wonderful career absolutely wonderful um and um i would recommend it to anybody um but i think you have to have a passion you have to to, to do well in any job you have yeah. to have a passion for it um and and i think mm. when you do have that it shows and i think that that shows in the results that you get as well so yeah absolutely yeah well, that's fabulously put and a great way to end our interview. Oh, so, well, thank you. I've... Again, thank you so much for your time today, Claire. <laughs> well, I've really enjoyed being on and, um, and keep in touch. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. Bye, Bye now.